Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd. Welcome to Soothkeep. Today I would like to encourage your hearts with another Rapture Nugget. We are going to look at the good news that someday soon we are going to enjoy the wonderful opportunity to enjoy sweet fellowship with all of the saints of all of the ages. Now this means, for instance, that if you please, you will be able to go out for coffee with Daniel and Noah. Now, if you prefer, of course, tea or mate or herb tea of any kind, just feel free to substitute your favorite beverage for coffee as I proceed in this video. Because, well, personally, I really like coffee and it's not even close as far as the other beverages go. But on to the subject. We're going to have wonderful fellowship in eternity. And I mentioned Noah and Daniel, but don't think for a moment that your fellowship opportunities are going to be limited to just these two. You are going to be able to have coffee with any patriarch, with any apostle, with any prophet, with any Old Testament personage, with any New Testament personage, with any church history personage that you please. For that matter... The courts of heaven are going to be filled with an amazing variety of artists and historians and authors and scientists and inventors and explorers and, and athletes. And you are going and these men are going to surpass the brightest and the best that the ungodly world has ever produced. And you're going to have the opportunity to sit down for coffee with these gentlemen and these ladies and pick their brains, and to talk shop. It's going to be a wonderful time in eternity. Now, the Bible nowhere states this coffee clatch concept directly, but it doesn't need to. It contains broad principles that apply to fellowship and opportunity in eternity. And that implies that you're going to be able to have coffee with your heroes in eternity. And that implies that you're going to have a, a million other fulfilling opportunities and engagements in eternity, given time and opportunity. And you've got infinite time and infinite opportunity. Now, understanding and applying the Bible in this broad principle manner honors God, because this is God's design and intent to use the Bible. One of my favorite passages in the Bible for this concept of broad fellowship opportunities in eternity is in Matthew 8, 11, where we read, Many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is not given as a Sunday school tidbit or a Bible quiz question on who's going to be the guests of honor at the wedding supper, at the start of the kingdom. This is given to us as a heartwarming promise that the average Joe is going to rub shoulders in the kingdom with the heroes of the faith, or the heroes in any field you please. You have to understand that passages like this are not exhaustive. They are representative. They give you an idea of the broad spectrum that you're going to experience in eternity. If the Jews are going to rub shoulders at the wedding supper with their patriarchs, then this implies that you are going to get to rub shoulders in eternity with your patriarchs. I fully expect to rub shoulders with the great names amongst the Reformers and the Puritans and the Great Awakening preachers and the early dispensationalists and the contemporary dispensationalists. Now, there are numerous thoughts in the Bible which indicate that eternity is designed to give the believer perfect fulfillment in an infinite utopia that's designed for human beings. For instance, we see in numerous passages of Scripture a renewed heavens and earth. This is promised many times. It's the same heaven and the earth that we have now, purged by fire in the cleansing power of God in judgment. 
the, the new heavens and the new earth are going to be the redeemed people's inheritance. I want you to think about that. The believers are going to inherit all things, we read in Revelation 21.7. This means they're going to inherit everything that exists. Now, we also read in the scriptures of that the resurrection body is a tangible human body that's been glorified. In this, Christ himself is the pattern. And we see his pattern in the upper room at the end of his ministry, and we see it in his beach appearance with the believers, his disciples, at the after his resurrection. When we look at these circumstances, the Lord Jesus in his resurrection body was able to walk through a wall or sit in a chair. He was able to walk on water and then sit at the beach at a campfire eating fish and bread with the disciples. In other words, he could interact with physical creation, but he wasn't limited by physical creation. And our resurrection body, according to Philippians 3.21, is going to be just like his glorious resurrection body. We will be able to walk through a wall and sit in a chair. We will be able to walk on water and be able to sit down around a campfire and enjoy fresh caught fish and fresh baked bread. We are going to have an amazing experience interacting with the entirety of physical creation, but we will not be limited by physical creation. We also read about eternity that our soul is going to be preserved. We read, for instance, in Matthew 16, 25, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. Now, the word life here is actually suke, not zoe. In other words, it's talking about the soul and not physical life. Now, if we fill in the, the word soul, then this verse reads in this way. For whosoever will save his soul shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his soul for my sake shall find it. Now, there's a significant difference in meaning here by whether we're thinking life or thinking soul. Because the human being is a tripart tripartite person. Now, Zoe is your physical life. This is your physical body. It's the means to support physical life. It's the fact of life. Now, the soul is the seed of your likes, your desires, your preferences, your tastes. It's what makes you, you, as opposed to somebody else with their set of things that they like and prefer. Now, the spirit transcends the soul. The spirit is your self-awareness so that you are aware of what you like and what you dislike. The spirit is the ability to operate on higher principles that rise above the soul. It's in the spirit that you're able to re resist temptation. It's in the spirit that you're able to set higher principles above things that are legitimate, but they're not the best investment for the present time. It's in this, the realm of the spirit that we are connected to the spiritual realm and it's the realm of the spirit that was designed to be connected with God. Now, armed with this understanding, Matthew 16, 25 says, whoever lives for the pleasures of his soul shall lose his soul. And whosoever ceases to live for the pleasures of his soul and instead lives for my things in this life, he shall save his soul. This is a very interesting concept that broadens and deepens your understanding of what faith is. Because faith, according to, for instance, in the book of Hebrews, it's putting your eyes on the big things that are offered by God and rejecting the paltry things that are offered by this world, by this life, and by the pleasures of sin. So faith isn't merely mental assent, folks. It's not merely putting your initials by some doctrinal propositions. Faith is your heart embracing what God holds out for you in His Son and through His Son and rejecting what the devil in the world holds out to you in opposition to what God offers. Now, 
what we have then with this promise in Matthew 16, 25, in this concept of soul, is that there is a guarantee that every believer is going to have the same soul in eternity that he has right now. Every person is going to be the same person with nothing missing except for sin. So all your earthly desires, all your normal human desires, all your hobbies, all your passions, all your interests, they are going to be intact. This, folks, is the Word of God understood plainly. And this is a guarantee that your love for coffee, or perhaps your love for tea, or your love for herb tea or mate, it, that love is not going to be missing. It's not going to be missing in action. It will still be intact in the resurrection. We read in Psalm 1611 that the believer is going to enjoy pleasures forevermore at the Father's right hand. Now, at the right hand, this is the place of sonship, it's the place of honor, it's the place of privilege, it's not the place of servanthood. And you've, we also have to understand when we read the word pleasures here, we're not, it's not legitimate to insert a bunch of hyper-spiritual notions into the word pleasure here of what the eternal pleasures are. Because remember, we've just noticed that eternity includes the renewed heavens and earth, the new heavens and earth, and they are physical substance, a physical universe. And we saw that there's going to be a bodily resurrection. You are going to have your same body you have now with all of its defects removed, and it's going to be glorified. And you're going to have the same soul that you have now. So you get the same universe. You've got the same body glorified. You've got the same universe glorified. You've got the same body glorified. You have the same soul purged of sin. Now, in this context, that's the context that you have to understand pleasures forevermore at the Father's right hand. If you don't understand that context, you're going to go down a hyper-spiritual path rather than the true spiritual path. Now, I love this because once you understand this context, in such a resurrection state, there is plenty of room for coffee, for coffee shops, and for coffee clatches where you get together with friends and visit. And assuming the truth of such a glorious resurrection with the physical universe and a physical body and the same soul that you got right now, assuming that kind of a resurrection, it's absurd to talk about an eternity where you don't have the kind of pleasures that we have right now. Now, you can add, you can expand the pleasures that man will enjoy. You cannot reduce them. You can, so you see where I'm going with this. One more thought on this. Uh, in John 16, 23, we read, And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name shall be given to you. He will give it to you. This is, this is a whatsoever, folks. And when God says whatsoever, he means whatsoever that isn't intrinsically sin. There's no limitations here. The sin nature is gone. So with the sin nature gone, sin removed from the universe, Anywhere you look, in any direction you look, anything you ask for will be given to you. This appeals to the human soul. Of course, we're talking about its natural desires, its human desires. We're not talking about the perverted, sinful desires. Now, it's shallow, superficial, hyper-spiritual theology that confuses the sin nature and human nature. Human nature is not wrong. God created human nature. God created humans to like coffee. God created coffee. God created humans to like black tea. He created black tea. God created human beings to enjoy mate. He created mate. He created all this for man, for them to enjoy. And it's carnal to deny that. 
That's hyper spirituality, folks, is just a form of religious carnality. Now, this broad opportunity that's laid out for us in passages like John 16, 23, the opportunities are as broad as your interests and your tastes. God has basically given us an open checkbook for the entire range of creation, the entire range of potential um, experiences, the entire range of potential opportunities, the entire range of potential interests. And he says, you can look at this whole mass and whatsoever you ask out of that shall be given to you. And in this broad perspective, man, there's plenty of room for coffee and tea and mate and coffee shops and sitting down with Noah and Daniel or Moses and Samuel or whoever you please. John the Revelator and the Apostle Paul. So in conclusion, you have an amazing eternity coming. There's lots of coffee fellowship or tea fellowship or mate fellowship with dear friends for millions and billions of years. And you are going to have your favorite coffee haunts. You're going to have your favorite coffee nooks. You are going to have coffee nooks at your friend's house. You're going to have coffee shops. You're going to have coffee on the patio. You're going to have coffee on amazing overlooks. You're going to have coffee on spaceships traveling to distant galaxies. And while you're up there in eternity, make sure you come visit me at my coffee outlet, Red Planet Beans, on the Red Planet itself. Eyes wide open, brain engaged, heart on fire. We'll see you next time.